morning, everyone, and welcome to our Coyote Information Session. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us this evening. Your participation and contributions to the Coyote Conversation help to share information and encourage community efforts to manage interactions with wildlife. My name is Selena Campbell. I'm the Manager of Enforcement Services, and I'm going to be your facilitator for this evening's session. So my goal for this evening is to provide a productive and informative session for everyone. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Oakville, as we know it today, is rich in the history and modern traditions of many First Nations. From the lands of the Anishinaabe to the Attawandron and the Haudenosaunee, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in First Nations history. As we gather today on the sacred lands of Treaties 14 and 22, we are in solidarity with our Indigenous brothers and sisters to honor and respect Mother Earth, the original nations, the trees and the plants, the four-legged and the flyers, the finned and the crawlers, as the original stewards of Mother Earth. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the waters as being life and being sacred to the carriers of those teachings, the females. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the wisdoms of the grandfathers and the four winds that carry the spirits of our ancestors that walk these lands before us. The town of Oakville is located on treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the treaty holders, for being stewards of this traditional territory. So tonight, we are here to address concerns and questions about coyotes and their interactions with people and pets. There are a lot, there's a lot of information and misinformation that's available online and circulating through our community. Council and staff have committed to providing residents with the most accurate and up-to-date information. We understand that coyotes can elicit strong feelings and we ask everybody to channel that passion into constructive comments and questions. Tonight's agenda consists of related, uh, sorry, Zoom related instructions, panelist introductions, a presentation from the from the town on coyotes and the Coyote Education and Response Program, the presentation from staff at the Oakville and Milton Humane Society, and finally, finally we'll move into a question and answer period uh, where, where we'll answer questions that are submitted through this evening's session, as well as questions that have already been submitted. The session will end at 7 o'clock tonight or at the end of the Q&A section. Please know that the session is being recorded, so anyone who is not able to participate with us this evening will be able to view it at a later time. Uh, the recording will be made available on the Town of Oakville website at oakville.ca. For those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom, as an attendee, you cannot be seen or heard by us or any other panelist. We invite you to submit questions through the Q&A, uh, and that feature will be available at the bottom of your screen. The icon may vary depending on the device that you're using. We will be monitoring the Q&A to collect your questions for response by panelists. If you have any questions or comments after tonight's meeting, please forward them via email to enforcement at oakville.ca. If by chance your question is not answered tonight, please know we are collecting all questions and comments for consideration. Tonight, we have with us Caitlin Jones, Supervisor of Enforcement Services, Tracy Clapham, Acting Supervisor with Municipal Enforcement Services, Steve Rizzotti, Strategic Business Advisor with Municipal Enforcement Services. Now, Steve, you'll see later tonight as well. He'll be reviewing your questions through the Q&A. He'll be grouping like questions together. So uh, if you see your question, it may not be worded exactly the way you had posed it, uh, because we will be answering multiple questions with one response. We have Sebastian Metashevsky. Uh, he's a municipal standards investigator. Lindsay Alberts, administrative officer and dispatcher with Oakville and Milton District Humane Society. Sabrina Parson, supervisor of animal protection services with Oakville Milton Humane Society. And Leslie Sampson, founding executive director of Coyote Watch Canada. Some members of council will also be watching this evening to hear your questions and concerns. Now with that said, uh, let's get started with our presentation by Tracy Clapham uh, on the Coyotes and the Coyote Education Response Program. Thanks very much and we'll put it over to you, Tracy. Thank you. 
Good evening, members of the public, councillors, and town staff that have joined us today. My name is Tracy Clapham, and I am the Acting Supervisor of Enforcement Services, and I oversee the Kairi program in Oakville. I am here today to provide you with a brief overview of Coyotes in Oakville and our program, which has been developed to support the community with coexistence of wildlife and coyotes. As part of the presentation, information will be provided on understanding coyote science and adopting co coexistence, the coyote program in Oakville, including resources available to you, roles and responsibilities of partners connected to our program, and information on coyote education and response procedure. The town of Oakville is home to the Eastern Coyote, a highly intelligent omnivore with strong ability to adapt to their environment. They are creative foragers and hunters able to thrive in urban areas where they find an abundance of food and shelter. The Eastern Coyote's diet is predominantly made of vegetables, plants, grubs, insects, small rodents, carrion, and fruit tree droppings. Coyotes are active when resources are available to them, which is both during the day and night. Coyotes are part of our natural habitat and provide us with several ecological benefits, such as population control of small mammals, which helps to reduce the spread of zoonotic diseases, which is diseases that can be transferred to humans. Eastern coyotes are often referred to by their nickname, koi wolf, however, it is important to know that they are the same species. The eastern coyote reaches a maximum of 45 pounds, but may appear larger due to their lanky stature and their large, full fur coats. To provide a bit of context to the nickname, the genetic makeup of an eastern coyote stems from over 100 years ago when the wolf population in the Algonquin area was greatly reduced and as a result were forced to breed with the Western coyote, which is why wolf is found in their DNA. It is important distinction to make that the Eastern coyote is not a true hybrid species and is a close relative to the wolf, fox, jackal, and family dog. It is not uncommon to hear the sounds of coyotes yipping and howling. Like us, they vocalize to communicate, to warn one another of danger, and to act as a canid GPS. They are capable of making a variety of sounds, which is frequently gets misinterpreted as large groups of coyotes, when typically it is only two or three of them. There is a term for this, and it is called the bow jest effect. Coyotes are typically are solitary foragers and hunters. Coyotes are often mistaken as vocalizing when they are eating, but like people, it is not ideal to be talking with your mouth full. Coyotes are monogamous and they mate for life when left to thrive. If we see coyotes together, it is referred to as their family unit, one family per territory. If they can also, they can also live as a solitary coyote that involves a lot of traveling where they're likely constantly on the move. They are devoted and protective parents to their young. An average litter size is approximately two to five pups, but larger litter sizes are not uncommon when there are an abundant of resources available. During this seasonal milestone is where we may see some interactions between dogs and coyotes. When coyote parent feels threatened by a domestic dog they may, that may be getting closer in proximity to their young. Their pups are born in the spring and they raise them until they disperse. Dispersal may be at various times of the year and they would disperse to try to establish their own home range or territory. Coyotes that have dispersed will periodically reunite with their family. Coyotes only use a den for a short period of time while the pups are small. After that, the parents relocate them to a safe location called a rendezvous site, where the pups will be left while the parents go find food. This is typically when people mistaken the pups for being abandoned. As I mentioned, 
Coyotes are devoted parents. Pups are never abandoned, but what could happen is they become orphaned. Feeding wildlife is one of the leading causes of escalating conflict between humans and wildlife. All wildlife, including canids, which is your coyotes and your foxes, will gravitate towards a food source. Direct feeding is where food is purposely left out for animals or when people hand feed an animal. The town of Oakville is receiving numerous calls a year where people are deliberately leaving food out in a manner to feed wildlife. Indirect feeding can be improperly stored garbage, fruit tree droppings, vegetable gardens, or a meal meant for a personal pet. I like to remind everyone that if you are feeding one, you are feeding them all. Something as small as an improperly kept bird feeder will produce a universal feeding source for small rodents, birds of prey, squirrels, rats, opossums, and then naturally, those small mammals are now attractants to larger ones, such as coyotes. Feeding also impacts proximity tolerance to people. Proximity tolerance is the reaction in an animal where their instincts to stay away from people are hindered due to the food-driven reward. If you know of any feeding, please report it to Service Oakville for a follow-up investigation. Coyotes and foxes are part of our natural environment and our actions can impact the way they behave. Implement these practices to help promote a healthy coexistence among wildlife. Don't leave out harmful handouts such as food. Don't hand feed wildlife. Don't feed your pets outside. If you have a bird feeder, please review the town's lot maintenance bylaw 2023-075 as it sets out the re requirements for a bird feeder. For example, how it is to be installed and that the feeder must be clean and the droppings removed. Take steps to wildproof your, your property, such as closing access points under sheds and decks. Keep your property clear of debris and wood piles. Store garbage in proper receptacles and only put your garbage out on the morning of garbage pickup. All of these measures help to maintain safe and healthy boundaries between us and wildlife. Your yard is part of a greater ecosystem. Coyotes are just one of the many risks and dangers to domestic pets when left outdoors unattended, particularly small dogs and cats. Some things you can do to ensure their safety is to monitor them when they're outside in your yard and not leave them unattended. As pet guardians, we can mitigate unsafe situations by making informed choices. The town of Oakville has several bylaws in place, such as ensuring your dogs are leashed when not on your property or in a designated leash-free zone, and ensure that cats are kept indoors as they are not permitted to roam free. The Oakville and Milton Humane Society will touch more on this topic later in the presentation. Following these steps will help promote positive coexistence. Coyotes will sometimes shadow people, which can be reported as being followed. A coyote is typically just being curious and monitoring the situation closely while escorting, escorting you away from their home. Similarly, if you're looking out your window onto your property because you thought someone was entering into your yard. Aversion conditioning or humane hazing is a humane, non-lethal action or deterrent to encourage a coyote to retreat and reshape their behavior. It is used to establish safe and healthy boundaries for people and wild animals. It is important to never utilize this technique on a sick or injured coyote or one that may be protecting a den area, a young pup, or a food source. Never use a dog as a tool to haze or harass a coyote. It is not humane or effective. If you encounter a coyote on your property, or if you are approached by a coyote on a walk, you can respond by humanely hazing it. First things first, stay calm. Never turn your back and run. 
appear larger and use a loud, assertive voice, yelling, not screaming, wave arms high above the head, keep eye contact while deploying humane hazing techniques with a coyote. Be adaptable to the situation. You can slowly back away at any time. Tools that can aid in successful humane hazing include items such as an umbrella, which you can take on a walk and open and close to appear larger, a can of marbles or coins, or a set of keys to use as a noisemaker. A whistle, something that is compact, can be taken with you. Bear in mind that coyotes are adaptable and get used to frequent, her, frequently heard noises. They also have different histories and may not respond similarly to the same stimuli. If you live near a school or a park, they may be more comfortable around certain sounds, whistles, and loud noises. My personal favorite method is the bag method. It is small enough to keep in your pocket, but has a large impact when you fill it and snap it. This message will create, sorry, this method will create a large visual and a sound deterrent. If a coyote is relaxing in the sun in your yard, you may want to help reshape that behavior. And sometimes these items are not available readily to you. So by grabbing maybe a pot or a wooden spoon and making some noise, you're also humanely hazing and potentially reshaping that behavior. A coyote behavior isn't likely to become reshaped immediately. They may retreat from you and then stop and look back to gauge whether they can continue as they were from that new distance. Similarly, if they move off your yard today, they may come back at a later date. Deploying behaviors such as aversion conditioning, removing feeding sources, and keeping pets appropriately leashed, we can resolve future community issues. As we are learning here today, the role of maintaining the coexistence of people, pets, and wildlife is a group effort. Each partner involved in this group plays an important role in working towards this balance. The town helps facilitate these roles so that the community receives the support through education. The town identified the following partners and the responsibilities for each. The town of Oakville is responsible for overseeing the coyote education and response procedure. Investigations as outlined in that procedure. Maintaining the coyote reporting tool and the relevant data. Community outreach and public engagement, such as tonight installing signage and utilizing other coexistent measures in parks. Property owners are responsible for managing coyotes on their property. Preventative measures such as removing attractants and wildlife proofing your property. Responsible pet guardianship, setting appropriate boundaries with wildlife, learning about wildlife in your community and sharing that information with family and friends. The Oakville Humane Society is responsible for responding to sick or injured wildlife calls, including coyotes and foxes. Enforcement of town bylaws related to domestic pets, for example, pets off leash, removal of dead animals from public roadways, and education. We also leverage external partners such as Coyote Watch Canada to assist with, with us. Scientific expertise, community education and aversion conditioning, and investigations. The Ministry of the Natural Resources assists with policy and legislation and supports with educational materials. Lastly, Halton Regional Police Service can assist in the unlikely situation where there is an immediate threat to personal safety. Through good teamwork, we can all empower our community to coexist with wildlife. The town regularly updates the Coyote program to reflect best practices. The coexistence program is housed with Municipal Enforcement Services Department and incorporates on the ground resources by supporting the community with education, outreach, and investigations based on Coyote reports. We are able to do this through the use of the following tools. Access to external partners such as Coyote Watch Canada and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Coyote reporting tool, municipal bylaws, investigations connected, conducted by municipal enforcement officers, 
installation of signage in parks and trails to alert patrons of the presence of coyotes, distribution of flyers to neighborhoods, public engagement sessions, utilizing education and advertising devices, access to web content, and social media. To further assist residents to understand the Coyote program in Oakville, staff have developed a Coyote education and response procedure. It is based on the best known Coyote management practices in an urban environment and incorporates strategies that directly address the primary reasons coyotes may come in conflict with people. The procedure categorizes each report type with the town's response level. Emphasis for the program is focused on public engagement and awareness and responding appropriately when interacting with wildlife. This framework includes responses taken for coyote sightings, den sightings, situations where the coyote has approached or followed a person or pet, and an escalated response in the event of a physical interaction with a person or a pet. Key preventative practices such as limiting food, shelter, water, and avoiding leaving pets unattended or roaming free are key to minimizing potential negative interactions between people, pets, and coyotes. This simplified approach provides clarity to the public and supports current education and communication programs in responding to public concerns about coyotes and is available on our website. The reporting tool in 2012, sorry, the reporting tool was introduced in 2012 to serve a multi-use tool alongside the coyote management strategy. The report system continues to be a key part of the coyote education and response procedure today. It provides the residents an opportunity to submit their coyote observations, including photos, relating to various coyote interactions and view other submissions through the online map. It also provides staff the opportunity to review data quickly and assist with where efforts and resources need to be deployed. This form does not allow staff to determine the numbers of coyotes as the same coyote often generates several sightings and reportings a day. It is a useful tool to help identify areas in the community where coyotes may be more active. This highlights areas where signage can be installed to promote awareness and also helps when investigating reports of active feeding in our community. The data from this tool will assist in identifying the response to be taken based on the type of report. As noted in the Coyote Response Procedure Strategy, staff will respond according to the report type and may include distribution of flyers, installation of signs, maybe even updating um, to close garbage systems in parks. The response from the town will increase based on the strategy and will include more in-depth investigations relating to den sites or interactions with domestic pets or people. In recent years, we have been successful with mitigating direct and indirect feeding sources and identifying active dens based on information shared through this tool. We do rely heavily on the eyes and ears of the public to assist in providing information, and this, and this platform helps with that. For more information relating to educational materials such as humane hazing videos, e-learning modules, seasonal coyote information, as well as our bylaws, please visit oakville.ca. Thank you for your attention and attendance here tonight. At this time, I would like to pass the podium over to Lindsay Alberts with the Oakville and Milton Humane Society to speak to their involvement with wildlife, coyotes, foxes, and your pets here in Oakville. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I and my colleague, Officer Person, are happy to be representing the Oakville and Midland Humane Society tonight. As Tracy previously mentioned, I am going to be sharing with you what our role in the community of Oakville is. I do want to advise that some of the photos in the presentation do depict sick and injured wildlife taken by the staff at the shelter that could be distressing to some viewers, so please do be advised. Our mission statement at the Oakville Milton Humane Society is that we are committed to the humane treatment and care of animals in our urban environment. 
Our mission statement states that we are dedicated to protecting and making life better for all animals and connecting the communities that care about them in Oakville and Milton. The Oakville and Milton Humane Society is contracted by the town of Oakville to assist with injured, sick, and orphan wildlife within the town in addition to picking up deceased animals on public property. Our team is available around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We offer a number of rescue and emergency services as both a part of our core mandate and in conjunction with our duties as the animal control service provider for the town of Oakville. The Oakville and Milton Humane Society responds to all calls as they are reported to us by mem members of the public like you. If you believe that a wild animal is sick, abandoned, or injured, the best thing to do is give us a call. Our dispatchers will determine over the phone whether an animal protection officer needs to be dispatched to the location. Sick and injured wildlife requires professional care so that they can have the best chance at a healthy return to their natural habitats. There is a great deal of research and legislation behind our protocols. We do not take sighting reports, remove animals living on your home, in your home or on your property, or attend healthy wildlife calls. Healthy wildlife is a part of our environment and we must learn to safely coexist alongside with them. We also strive to remain in line with the Ministry of Natural Resources legislation, which states that all wildlife must be re-released within one kilometer of where they are originally found. And our goal is to be able to provide the necessary care for all animals to return to the wild. As part of our mandate, we are contracted by the town of Oakville to enforce animal control bylaws. These bylaws help to ensure proper pet guardianship as well as create a foundation for peaceful communities among people and animals. As stewards of this piece of legislation, our overall goal is compliance through education and enforcement, which we'll dive deeper into later on. In addition to coyotes, I wanted to touch on foxes as well. Foxes are very much part of our life here in Oakville. Like coyotes, there can be a lot of miscommunication surrounding foxes, which can cause confusion and fear in the community. Foxes are not known for attacking humans. However, they have become very comfortable around us because they have been conditioned to live in an urban environment. An important aspect of coexisting with foxes is resp responsible pet guardianship, such as monitoring your pets when they are out in your backyard to ensure their safety. Foxes commonly use behaviors called shadowing as they become interested as to what is going on in their territory. In doing so, they will stare at people or animals that they see nearby to assess what they are doing. This is just a display of natural curiosity, not predatory behavior. Humane hazing helps to deter this behavior and tells the animal that they are not welcome in your neighborhood. So what should you do when you encounter a coyote or a fox? We suggest taking the following steps derived from the Coyote Watch Canada website regarding humane hazing techniques. These steps contribute to establishing healthy boundaries between humans and coyotes. Step one is to stop. If you have small children or pets with you, pick them up if you're able. Step two is to stand still. Never run from a coyote or fox as this may entice them to follow you. Instead, use low, loud, and vocal noise to shout or throw something in the animal's general direction, but not at the animal. Step three is to make yourself big. Wave your arms or make large movements such as popping an umbrella open or snapping a large garbage bag through the air. Step four is to be loud and assertive. Shout, stomp your feet, or try clapping your hands. Step five is to slowly back away. Be assertive as you leave to, as you leave to ensure the animal knows it is not welcome. We will now go into a bit more depth regarding the animal control bylaws that our animal control officers enforce in the town of Oakville. The Oakville Milton Humane Society provides enforcement of various animal welfare and control legislation through our service agreement with the town of Oakville. I wanted to highlight the bylaws that can address the risks of conflict with wildlife. The poop and scoop bylaw addresses excrements left by domestic animals which must be picked up and properly disposed of in a timely manner, including on your own property. Rodents are attracted to animal excrement which attracts wildlife such as coyotes. So it is imperative that you pick up after your animal to ensure the continued safety of those in our community. 
Cats are not permitted to roam freely in their owner's property. Sorry, so sorry. Cats are not permitted to roam freely, freely off their owner's property in the town of Oakville. Cats with access to the outdoors are at risk of many environmental dangers such as diseases, vehicles, poisoning, wildlife, and extreme weather. Though the bylaw does permit cats to be outside on private property, the Oakville Milton Humane Society advocates for indoor cats only due to the risk outweighing the benefits. Dogs must be on leash at all times unless on the, unless on the owner's property or at a designated leash-free dog park. Domestic dogs can be considered competition for food items and territory, and coyotes may attempt to defend themselves against a domestic dog to protect their families. Dogs who are allowed to roam off-leash outside of private property or leash-free areas can lead to an increase in conflicts with coyotes due to trigger stacking. This means that if a coyote has had a bad experience with a dog in the past, it can lead to them being more alert and defensive due to past trauma. Additionally, most dogs with even the strongest recall likely have not been trained in a situation with a coyote before, and it is possible that your dog will see the coyote as a distraction, which can cause them to be pulled out of their tunnel vision. Dogs, when on a leash, are more in your control and safer of unknown dangers and potential conflicts. I will now spend some time reviewing OMHS's recommendations on safe pet guardianship. Always keep your dog on a leash regardless of their recall ability or behavior. Avoid walks at dusk and dawn. Carry deterrents such as umbrellas, branches, or air horns. Find a walking buddy for you and your dog and do not allow your children to walk your dog. Always supervise dogs while on your property. OMHS recommends not allowing your coat cat to roam off your property or leaving them unattended outside in your yards or on a tie out. Coyotes are only one of the number of countless threats that outdoor cats can encounter. We do not advise you to bring any small animals or pets outside nor leave them unattended outdoors. Compliance with the animal control bylaws not only ensures that your pet is safe from the potential threats and unforeseen circumstances, but also that your neighbors and other community me members can enjoy living in the town together. Many people are frightened by domestic animals or may not enjoy being around them on their property. These bylaws ensure that everyone can freely enjoy the town of Oakville together. If you do witness a bylaw violation in your neighborhood, you can call us at the Oakville Milton Humane Society to file a report. In closing, I wanted to share an important quote with you, which reads, each species on your planet plays a role in a healthy functioning of a natural ecosystem in which humans depend on. At the Oakville and Milton Humane Society, we are committed to the peaceful coexistence between humans and animals, and through our daily work, we strive to be a reliable resource of education and promote the humane treatment of all animals. On the screen, I've included the contact information of the shelter and for myself, if you have any further questions or comments. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. Terrific. Thank you very much for that presentation. Much appreciated. I, I like that quote about, you know, all animals being part of the natural ecosystem. And, and I can think as a, being an enforcement officer, how many reports we get about rats and that sort of thing and, and the benefits that, you know, you can have from having balance within our ecosystem. So I think um, we're ready for our Q&A now, so we'll go ahead and get started with that. Uh, we have a few questions that uh, have been submitted prior to our meeting tonight. If you, at any point, or hopefully uh, you already have, submitted any questions you have, um, any comments, Steve is collecting them, and he will be adding them at the end of the, the um, pre-noted questions. So we'll get started with these. So our first question is, why are we so accepting of coyotes now being part of our communities? And why are residents being asked to coexist? So I'm gonna ask Caitlin Jones with uh, Municipal Enforcement Services to come up and, and respond to this. Thanks, Caitlin. Perfect, uh, thank you for the question. Um, as I um, know we've gone over a couple of times today, um, coyotes, as well as other wildlife, such as raccoons, squirrels, skunks, rabbits, things like that, are part of our urban environment. So it is expected that we are going to see them here. Um, and they are, uh, coyotes specifically are a key, 
keystone species, and they are indicative of a thriving ecosystem. Um, they do provide several ecological benefits, such as population control of small rodents, which Selena just made comment of, um, and it also helps limit the spread of diseases, uh, specifically zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that can be transferred from animals to humans. Um, so they do provide a lot of benefits uh, to being in our ecosystem here. Um, our town council has approved our coyote education and response procedure, um, which was developed around best um, known coyote management practices in an urban environment. Um, and it is a tool to provide information to residents and to help address the root causes of um, circumstances that can cause conflict in an urban environment. Um, so if there is a circumstance of coyote conflict, we always suggest um, reporting on a reporting tool or contacting the town so we can uh, continue to proceed with our process through that re reporting tool and through our response procedure to address any of those concerns. Um, but uh, as, as mentioned, it is to address root causes of concerns as opposed to a Band-Aid solution. So we're looking for long-term solutions, knowing that coyotes are part of our natural environment um, and they're of great benefit to us here as well. So by resolving itch issues such as feeding wildlife and off-leash dogs, um, we can help coexist as a, a community together. Uh, actually, if you want to stay there, my next question is for you as well. Uh, so if coyotes are very active in a park, can the town post more warning signs about their presence? Great question. Um, so I will say for the most part, most uh, trail systems and parks throughout the town do have um, signage posting, um, basically providing awareness that coyotes um, may be present. Um, in, in circumstances where, um, you know, maybe there's a report of a known den site um, in a park or something like that, we, we absolutely can um, follow our procedure and erect barricades and install additional signage, potentially to redirect walking routes and things like that to notify the community um, that there is a den site present. Um, in addition, if there's any, um, if we conduct any investigations, as part of those investigations, our staff will do um, walkthroughs if it's near by a park and um, they will basically do inventory to, to make sure that um, identify any signage deficiencies potentially, uh, any garbage deficiencies, things like that. So signage is part of that review and if we notice that they're not there or they're not um, visible, um, we will absolutely engage our parks team to have those installed, especially if there's an increase in sightings um, in areas where they're not already present. Um, in addition to that, with signage, um, seasonally and, and typically during seasonal milestones, um, such as you know spring and fall, uh, we will look to engaging our reporting tool and where we are seeing most sightings taking place and we will also be um, we also do erect community mobile signs um, to raise awareness to coyotes and where to go for resources on our town website um, but yes if you have any concerns for signage deficiencies and you're aware of um, coyotes be sure to continue to report on our reporting tool because we absolutely value that information um, and we're, we're more than happy to assist in that way Great, thanks Caitlin. We'll give you a break for just a moment. And I think our next question, the OMHS touched on a little bit, but I think I'm gonna ask Leslie from Coyote Watch Canada to come on up and respond to um, a resident who has concerns about coyotes sunning themselves on their front lawn and, and what should they do? Thanks Leslie. Thank you, great question. So first and foremost, if you do have a coyote or two hanging around your property, you want to get out there and do that property audit to make sure that there aren't attractants, uh, there could be holes in fencing, that kind of thing. And if you've done that, and then you're also looking as well, if you do have a rodent problem, sometimes you might have uh, rats or mice that are present and they could be hanging around for that reason as well. So after doing all of those steps, and you're still noticing that there's revisiting of that particular coyote or two, then please do uh, you know, resort to the humane hazing if you're comfortable doing that. Most definitely though, you would have to do those techniques outside of your home. You don't wanna be yelling from an inside the window or standing inside a sliding door, banging pots. You wanna make sure that the coyote sees you and so the other thing that I would um, caution about as well, if uh, the coyote is showing signs of hair loss, then there could be a health issue. And then you would be reaching out not only um, to, the, uh, to the Humane Society, but also um, you might want to include photographs of that particular animal 
because oftentimes uh, canids that have hair missing, they will seek areas where there's uh, warmth from sunshine as well. And so if there's an injury, again, you're going to be reaching out to uh, Oakville Milton Humane Society and reporting that. And you can also report that through um, the Oakville website as well. Thanks, Thank Leslie. You. Our next question is similar, so I'm going to ask you to stay for this one as well. Okay. Um, again, it's in their backyard, and, and should people be worried about um, children playing in their backyard? Yeah, so again, you want to make sure that you know what risks are in your backyard. You might have tree branches that need to be uh, taken care of. You might have uh, ways that kids could injure themselves. So um, using, you know, proper um, assessment of those inherent risks in the environment. And I would also, uh, you know, remind you that if you happen to see coyotes visiting your backyard, again, you need to determine why. And that can be done doing a site uh, investigation yourself. And if you need help or guidance, please do reach out to um, the town of Oakville. And also uh, Oakville Milton Humane has great information as well. And then um, if you feel that there are issues and a coyote is still revisiting the backyard, then please do report that using the website reporting system and always practice um, the good parenting and being aware of what animals and insects and birds are in, uh, you know, present in your backyard. And if there is a bird feeder, you want to make sure that that bird feeder is maintained appropriately so as to not attract small rodents that would in turn attract uh, wildlife to the backyard as well. Excellent, Thank thanks very much, Leslie. Thanks. Okay, I think our next question will bring Caitlin back up. Um, is what can I do to protect my dog on a walk? Uh, it did mention in the backyard as well, but I think that's been pretty reasonably well covered. So Caitlin, if you can um, address the, the protecting their dog on, on a walk. Absolutely, so I, I, I will go over both, um, just to reiterate some of the good information that we've learned here. Uh, tonight. Um, with respect to uh, responsible pet guardianship, we want to make sure if we're, if we're looking to be cognizant of our surroundings at all times, um, there's a lot of proactive things that we can do. So um, if you're looking to let your, um, your dog or pet, regardless of size, out into the backyard, you're monitoring them throughout the duration of that like I said, regardless of size. So um, we can take a step back even before that. Um, proactively, as Leslie mentioned, conduct a property audit. Um, make sure that you don't have any attractants outs or, or things that are going to be enticing for wildlife in general to come into your yard, um, as well as um, monitoring your pets. So you can do some simple tricks like learning, uh, I guess training your dog um, to wait at the door once you open the door so that they don't immediately run out into your yard and they will actually um, wait while you can take time to do a quick check, make sure there's nothing there, and then monitor them throughout the duration of being in the yard. Um, and then just a general awareness of your surroundings. If you're walking your animal um, on leash, make sure that it's in front of you. You don't have your earbuds in, so you're aware of your surroundings. Um, you're aware of you know the kind of the environment, any of the risks associated with that. You see the dog in front of you as opposed to, for example, maybe an extended leash behind you. It's really easy to get distracted. Um, just being aware uh, of those surroundings at all times. And then with respect to in your yards, again, we're looking at um, any f any feeding components and things like that. So if, if you do encounter um, a coyote when you're on a walk with your dog, I know this has been mentioned a few times, um, but just make sure that uh, they're leashed. You, if they're too big to pick up, that you put them um, close to you, stop, um, don't ever use your dog as a tool for aversion conditioning, but absolutely deploy aversion conditioning um, and make sure that you are being direct and communicating appropriately with that coyote so they know it's not appropriate to come, to come any closer. Um, so I think those are a few tips of how we can be uh, responsible pet guardians and hopefully um, mitigate any, any risks associated. Thanks, Caitlin. I love the idea of actually using that as a training opportunity for your dog to get them to stay well. Will you check the backyard, backyard out first before they go out? So our next question, I'll ask Leslie to come on back up. Uh, Leslie from Coyote Watch Canada. And here's the question. It's, are there different ta tactics for hazing when confronted with a pack, like six adults, versus one or two coyotes? What should we do differently if we encounter them? 
Great question. So uh, first, I'll just maybe clarify. So coyotes are living in related family groups. So we're not going to have individuals, uh, you know, hanging out together in uh, territory. So if you see a family, typically then uh, by the time about 10, 11 months old, last year's pups will be full grown and they'll look like adults. So you've got mom and dad and then pups from the last spring, or you could have yearlings that are one or two years older. And so bearing that in mind, uh, young pups, even though they look adult, they might be more curious if a uh, coyote family has had a history of dogs being off leash and chasing after them. There could be, um, as mentioned earlier, the issue of trigger stacking, so they might be on the defensive side. So if you know you're in an area and you've seen a group, a group of uh, coyotes and you know that there's dogs off leash, please do report that to the town of Oakville. They need to have that information and they count on your uh, commitment to provide um, those details as well. And so going through aversion conditioning, you always would have your dogs on a leash, even in areas. If you know that there is a local coyote family and it's an off-leash area, you make that informed decision to decide, you know what, my dog isn't, uh, doesn't have good recall, so I think I'm going to walk through this area with my dog on a leash. And if you notice that uh, members of that family of coyotes are starting to escort or shadow you, if it's during the seasonal milestones of pup rearing, you would then make sure, again, you need to report that interaction and then um, keep your dog very close to you. If that dog is small, pick the dog up as well and use your uh, voice, be very firm, and don't turn your back and run. And again, don't ever release your dog from a leash to chase after a coyote. It's not safe for the dog, it's not safe for the wildlife as well. Thanks. Excellent, thanks, Leslie. Um, and before you go too far, I, actually, I think maybe you and Caitlin can, can answer this next question together. It's a multifaceted question. So it's when humane hazing doesn't work, what's the next step? So in my experience of decades of working with uh, coyotes individually and with coyote families, um, anywhere up to uh, two adults, two yearling and nine pups, when aversion conditioning is deployed uh, appropriately uh, and using the right techniques and in the right instance, and there's um, investigations and insight into what's actually happening in the landscape, it should be working. If the method being used is not um, getting the response that you want, if, you, if you're trying to get a coyote, let's say that's in a field far away from you, and you're trying one of the techniques you're probably not close enough and maybe just continuing on your way is a better response for that. If the coyote starts to approach you, then you would engage and use those different methods. The bag method is very good and it sends a clear message to a coyote or a coyote family. Uh, it's very loud, it's dark, it's visual, and it's not something that they would see. And so you wanna make sure that you're following through. And again, so let's say, for example, you pull into a parking lot and a coyote is in the parking lot. That is 100% indication that that coyote has been fed. That needs to be rerouted and reported through the reporting system on the website of the town, and that way it can be investigated. If a coyote approaches you and you're in your vehicle and you're yelling from inside your vehicle, that might not be effective either. So if you've got that green garbage bag, you can put that out or get outside of the vehicle and yelling at the coyote. Um, so when coyotes are food conditioned and human conditioned, they might not respond immediately to those techniques of communicating and reestablishing those healthy boundaries. So if you're having difficulty and the method that you're using is not working, then you know safely back away, use those points that uh, Lindsay went through, and then make sure that you report it, and there's always uh, guidance that can be provided to you. And maybe Caitlin has more to elaborate on that 
uh, subject matter as well. I would say that that's a fulsome answer to that, so I'm, I'm satisfied. <laughs> All right, well, I won't let either one of you run away too quickly because I have another question for you. So in what circumstances will the town call coyotes in Oakville? And if, if we will, um, will others take their place? So just to note, our coyote education and response procedure does not speak to a culling program. It is um, specific to individual coyotes if there's conflict in a community um, to address, like I said, uh, the root uh, concern for um, basically the, the root prob problems essentially for what can cause coyote conflict in the environment. So so no, we do not have a culling, um, culling procedure, but I can ask Leslie if she would like to elaborate on um, the uh, inhumane aspect and, and how culling programs are um, ineffective. Yeah, so typically, based on the best science and the most current progressive science, if you were to remove all the coyotes in the community, uh, more would migrate in because it's great habitat for not just uh, canids, but all sorts of wonderful wildlife species, and that's what makes the town of Oakville such a beautiful, place, rich place to have wildlife thriving. So uh, if, if you removed a coyote family from an area, another coyote or two would come in. So if it's conflict that's wanting to drive that kind of response, then doing the field investigations and having officers attend uh, an area, whether it's a, a public or a private site, and determining what what is the issue. Is it attractants? Is it are, it are dogs off leash in this area? And so it's always better to address the issues within the community. And if if the landscape ends up not being suitable habitat for a coyote family, then they move on anyways. So, um, and you know, if you're removing coyotes uh, in a regular um, manner year after year, you're still going to have coyotes reestablishing and colonizing within um, the the boundaries of, of the town. Thanks, Leslie. Um, if I can add to, to that one, uh, what happens if a coyote attacks a human? And maybe that's a one we can direct to Caitlin. So just with respect to our program, um, we know that circumstances such as this are known to be uncommon. Um, and again, we have a program in place to, um, to set the framework and be proactive in uh, addressing any, any potential conflict prior to escalation. Um, however, I will mention that our coyote education and response procedure actually speaks to the action that the municipality will take based on certain scenarios uh, in terms of conflict with coyotes um, up to and, and not limiting um, a potential bite on a person. Um, and, and looking at that, we would uh, hope that the individual would contact the proper authorities in terms of um, seeking medical aid, contacting 911, um, to make sure that the um, proper wildlife um, components are captured with respect to public health, um, as well as reporting those um, those interactions, and if we receive a report of that nature, um, part of our program would be to conduct a very fulsome uh, investigation of the circumstances, reviewing um, you know, whether it was something that was provoked or unprovoked, if there was any feeding, um, anything like that that was taking place that could um, provide information and insight as to why something like that would occur. Um, so we would have that fulsome in investigation conducted. We would absolutely be engaging with our partners, um, such as Coyote Watch Canada, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Oakville Milton Humane Society, and potentially the uh, Halton Regional Police Services or trapping companies. Um, again, understanding that it is likely very uncommon, um, but our program does speak to uh, and does not eliminate the option of, um, of eliminating that coyote um, should it be located. Great, thanks. Uh, so the next question. Oh, sorry. I might Did you add, add to absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Caitlin, that was uh, that was comprehensive. I would like to add, though, as well, uh, that it would be important to identify the offending coyote that did actually bite 
um, a resident, so that can be very difficult. Um, but again, information and uh, you know anything that the public uh, can provide is very, very helpful as well. Thanks, Leslie. I, I think we can't stress enough how important our public engagement and, and hearing from residents is to, to make sure we have accurate information. I'm going to switch topics just a little bit and move uh, a little bit to habitat. Um, and given plans for increased development, are there any updates on how citizens can effectively coexist with coyotes? And hopefully uh, you can take this one, Leslie. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's a great question. And as you know, uh, you know, the town, like every other um, community, is experiencing growth. And so there is uh, a loss of habitat or a shift of habitat or there could be fragmentation or a loss of wildlife corridors. And so if the habitat is not suitable and provides all the essentials that uh, a family of coyotes would need to thrive, then they're going to move on. And so we, that's again why we can't stress enough. The messaging has been clear tonight. It's so important not to feed coyotes because if if there's a, a habitat and it's cut into a quarter and people are feeding those coyotes, then they're going to stay in that area where otherwise they would um, move on to a more suitable habitat. So typically the family is defending their territory. If there is a loss of habitat, and that's happened here, coyotes have had to adjust. Uh, but what does make it more difficult is when um, again, we're allowing our uh, beloved dogs to interact with coyotes or providing food sources that can really impact their natural ability to adapt and make those decisions um, to move out of an area that's not suitable anymore. And so I know that it's a, a difficult even for humans for us to um, look at habitat that disappears, uh, but you know we can work together as a community and support agencies that if this is happening and there's coyotes that are shifting and now navigating differently through the community, that be aware of that, what's happening, and sometimes it takes a little bit of patience and understanding as well. Thank you, Leslie. Actually, our next question is somewhat related. So it really is about that population control. So any attempt to control coyote population? No, because as, uh, as was mentioned throughout tonight, coyotes typically are regulating their own numbers. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, dispersal that takes place. Sometimes within a coyote family, it could be forced dispersal, again, going back to the loss of habitat and fragmenting of territory. So if we, if, and again, if we continuously lethally remove coyotes, there would be other coyotes coming in to take that uh, take over that habitat. So populations are very dynamic. There's a high mortality rate for young coyotes the first year of their life. It could be anywhere from 60 to 80 percent, depending on the location and what's happening in terms of vehicle and human interactions. Um, so if we look at populations as a reason to not want to see coyotes, remember, through the reporting system, when you report a coyote, there's probably uh, another dozen people that have seen that same coyote in that territory. And so looking at the, uh, po the map, um, the reporting map, remember that those are indications of sightings and not uh, individual coyotes. Thanks, Leslie. So the next question is uh, also about coyote really behavior. And it was touched on a little bit earlier uh, by the Oakville Mountain Humane Society, but hopefully you can elaborate a little bit. So what areas and or times are coyotes more prevalent? And is it safe to walk trails? What about at dawn or dusk? Should we avoid them? That's a great question. Again, it's all going to hinge on your comfort zone and if you're um, informed. Uh, you know, and you're not carrying a cell phone, you're not wearing earbuds, uh, you go out, especially if you're, you know, walking in the evening time, you can wear a, a headlamp, you can buy those at a Canadian Tire store. Um, but if there is an increase in uh, coyote activity in a particular area, and right now, um, April is around the time when the pups would be born, and so you might make a different decision at that time if you are walking with your family dog. And in those instances, you do want to make sure 
again, that your dog is on a leash. Even in those leash-free areas, if you know that there is a coyote family that's living in that area, you know, it's always better to be safe and proactive. And so dawn and dusk can be uh, common times for canids to be active. But really and truly, even if you haven't seen a coyote in the area, just understand that there's coyotes that are dispersing from the family, which could happen any time of the year. So there might be a coyote passing through. And you want to be alert and aware, as uh, mentioned earlier, throughout the presentations of your surroundings. And, um, you know, again, you can always go out for hikes uh, or in, on the trails with a buddy. But if you see any kind of food resource being left there, or if uh, there's a congregation of birds or squirrels or other uh, smaller mammals in the area and you notice that there's seeds or any kind of food, that needs to be reported. We know there was an instance where um, people were leaving bags of uh, food along a trail system. And of course, coyotes were coming in to access that food. And so that information is imperative to be uh, sent in with your report and right through um, service. So uh, again, going back to when is it, are, are, is there a season where they're active? They have to hunt and forage every day. And so uh, when they're raising their young ones, there's a lot of activity happening there. Mom and dad are both providing those food resources for the young ones. Um, during mating season, which is over, that typically happened in February. And so they're going to be defending their territories against transient coyotes, non-related coyotes, and also dogs off leash, their competition, and they're also a threat to coyotes. So coyote activity, um, if, you know, to be general about um, when and where they're going to be active, it's really uh, based on individual coyote and individual coyote families and their unique traits to their particular territory. Thanks, Leslie. And then we have one more behavioral question. If uh, This one's a little bit uh, different than we've seen so far, and it's can coyotes attack or approach a female dog in heat? I guess, is there a different in level of interest? Uh, first and foremost, so coyote females are monastrous, which means that they have one opportunity to procreate with their mate. And as mentioned earlier, again, coyote uh, male and female mate for life when left to thrive. So maybe um, first and foremost, I would never advise uh, a coyote, um, you know, coyotes, uh, my, my concern would be first and foremost with the dog that is not uh, spayed or neutered, running loose in the community, there could be an instance where those dogs could actually meet up with another dog that happens to be uh, available to mate with that dog. So I think um, practicing uh, good pet guardianship and leashing your dog and consider um, spaying or neutering as well, but definitely not having a, a dog free roaming that is uh, going through one of their reproductive cycles. So coyotes, again, um, they choose their own species and, um, you know, maybe a dog might be interested in a female coyote that would be in heat, but uh, that male coyote would also be defending her as well uh, against a, a domestic dog. So I think it's be in everybody's best interest to make sure that we have our dogs leashed up when they're in that kind of physical condition. And um, if you know of folks that, you know, have seen coyotes and dogs interacting together, again, just send a, a report into the town as well to alert them that folks are allowing their uh, domestic dog to play with uh, wild coyotes. Thanks, Leslie. Actually, my next question is for uh, staff from the Oakville Milton Humane Society. Um, and it, the question is, my neighbor feeds a lot of birds all the time, and the birds always hit our windows and die. Uh, what should we do with the deceased birds to make sure the coyotes don't eat them? Yeah, so deceased animals cannot be disposed in the garbage or the green bin in Halton. Um, to dispose of these uh, deceased wildlife, you can give us a call at OMHS, um, and one of our officers can come pick up the deceased animals um, and properly dispose of it. If the animal is on private property, there is a fee for pickup. 
This process can be done uh, during the shelter's operating hours, which can be found on our website, and you can just give us a call. Excellent, thanks very much. And then our next question is, how is information being submitted to the reporting tool being used? And I think I'll ask Caitlin to come up and, and respond to this one. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so the reporting tool is a really handy um, mapping uh, system that we use um, in our department, um, essentially to make sure that we have our finger on the pulse with respect to trends in uh, coyotes on an anecdotal level as um, being reported in the community. So we can't be everywhere all at once and we really heavily rely on public information. So it's um, really helpful. Um, the mapping system has uh, been able to assist us in seeing where you know there's concerns potentially. Um, we've received uh, feeding reports or we've been able to actually identify locations of where feeding is taking place based on sighting reports. Um, and we've had uh, uh, proven success uh, cases by utilizing that tool as well. Um, it also provides us uh, with information on where um, there might be a need for additional information, um, the community mobile signs uh, that we post seasonally, where those uh, should be placed uh, based on the season, as well as um, Again, like I mentioned, any of the, the feeding, uh, potential feeding sites. Um, and additionally, where to deploy our resources and, and information to the public. So if we receive um, maybe an escalated concern uh, or we see that there's a lot of coyote uh, presence in a particular area, maybe we need to conduct a flyer distribution in that area. Um, and also for tonight, any, of, uh, any of the individuals who report on the reporting tool and uh, click that box where they agree to be contacted, um, we'll, um, we will reach out to them when we do public and engagement, engagement and information sessions such as tonight uh, to make sure that everybody is included uh, on that information. And it is a very useful tool that we appreciate greatly. So if there's uh, any information that you like to share, we would suggest that you continue to, uh, to utilize it. Perfect, thanks very much, Caitlin. I know we're a couple minutes over. Um, we do have, uh, I think, a couple of questions in the chat that are getting together. Um, but in the meantime, I will ask one more of Leslie, if I could. And Leslie, what steps um, have other jurisdictions taken to proactively reduce the risk of human and pet and coyote interactions? That's a great question. So one thing I'm proud to say is that uh, many of the uh, multiple communities we engage with across uh, North America, they actually look to the town's program as a, a good template to uh, create a response uh, strategy for themselves. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, having those uh, key steps in place, a way to address uh, conflict, potential conflict, um, escalating situations, and also having instant response through the field investigations and the outreach with the public is so critical. And the communities that are successful have those cornerstones in place. And I would add as well though, it's because of folks like you, the engagement uh, coexistence programs cannot uh, be successful without um, the engagement and the cooperation and collaboration with citizens as well. And so that's always a key aspect of programs that really truly represent and utilize um, the coexistence uh, techniques and programs. Great, thanks Leslie, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think it really is that, that collaborative effort between agencies and the public and, and like Leslie says, it's so important to have every resident part of this program teaching each other, learning from each other. Uh, that's what makes it successful. So thank you to all of you. And I am going to ask Steve, I think, to ask our next question. Steve. Yep, thank you. Uh, one of the questions we have here are around the population of the coyote. Uh, population has grown increasingly in the last 10 years, um, and we want to know about that, and if we can tell what area in Oakville has the greatest number of sightings. Uh, 
Um, so in regards to population, coyote population, if it hasn't already been said tonight, um, there's currently no data that accu accurately reflects uh, wildlife population on, in Ontario, but it is known that wildlife population fluctuates year after year based on the available resources available to the animals, such as the food, the water, and the shelters. Our reporting tool, which was created in 2012, tracks sightings. However, it doesn't accurately reflect the coyote population. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that because once again, um, I've, heard, I've heard Leslie say that because the coyote reporting, um, they see the coyote going through that area and it gets reported numerous times a night. But um, you've asked for specific stats and what we can do is tell you that uh, we have had a decrease from 2022 to all of uh, our, using our reporting tool from 2022 to 2023, um, we've had a decrease in 20% um, in sightings reported. The other um, information that you were specifically looking for tonight uh, that was requested was the number of, where are we getting the most amount of uh, reports in Oakville? And I can share with you that that is um, in, make sure that I say the right word correctly, because I have it in my head. And, and that is uh, Ward 3. Um, so all together, whether it's approached or followed, den sightings, um, physical interactions, which can be um, a, reported as aggression, um, and then sightings in general um, is, is 300. Um, and we've heard tonight that maybe uh, we would like to, uh, that Oakville would like to see more statistics um, and more numbers showed. Um, and, and we're gonna take that back and definitely make some improvements next year. Um, and in the meantime, maybe even share some more things on our website. Thanks so much. Terrific, thanks very much, Tracy. Uh, and absolutely, we keep those comments coming in. Any questions, that sort of thing, you can put them through to enforcement at oakville.ca. Uh, we're happy to, to review those and we consider all the comments that are, that are received. And we're con constantly trying to update and improve our coyote reporting system and how we manage that data. So by all means, please uh, keep us informed of everything happening in your area. And I'll look to Steve, see if he has any follow-up questions or if that's everything that we have for this evening. Yeah, I have one more. Everything else was uh, covered in previous conversation. Oh, and um, you can just remind people that this video will be available on oakville.ca later to if they feel their question wasn't answered. Uh, but this one is to Caitlin. Uh, is it possible to be more strict in the poop and scoop laws? Are a lot of people leaving their dog droppings on the street? Same thing with people having their dogs off-leash at parks in the not off-leash zones. So uh, great feedback and thank you so much for that. So the Oakville and Milton Humane Society is actually responsible for enforcing the uh, animal control bylaw that we do have here in Oakville. So I'm actually gonna refer over to Lindsay um, if she would like to speak to this. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are at the Oakville Milton Humane Society uh, responsible for enforcing all animal control bylaws, which include the animal poop and scoop bylaw. Um, so at any time, you can give us a call and just let us know um, of the situation, how often it's occurring. Um, if you have photographic evidence, that would be wonderful. Um, and I would dispatch that information out to one of our animal control officers who would follow up. Um, as I mentioned in my previous uh, presentation, our goal is overall compliance and education, and we take enforcement where it's necessary. But we really want people to understand why the bylaws are in place and why they're so important. Um, they're not just important for coyotes, but also for keeping community members happy and for um, multiple reasons, basically. Um, so give us a call. We can open up an investigation, and our animal control bylaws are more than happy to provide you with explanations um, and follow-ups and any of those questions. Um, so yeah, just give us a call. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Lindsay. So I want to, again, extend my thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in tonight and took part and provided comments and questions to our staff. Uh, all of it is very valuable for us, and we do take it away, and, and we do build it into things that we do in the future. And hopefully we've provided answers to you, and if you haven't, by all means, give us an email uh, or give us a call. You can email at enforcement at oakville.ca. Uh, this 
uh, session has been recorded. Uh, it will be available on oakville.ca uh, as well. So feel free to go back and watch again and, and see if there's anything that you missed or you can learn. I, I certainly, um, I know I gained some stuff from, from tonight's presentation and I appreciate everybody's efforts here tonight. Uh, so thank you very much to every resident who uses our reporting system, who uses a version conditioning and you know, really participates in this program. Uh, it means a lot to us. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in and have a great night.